My dad would have never gone into the basement that night if he knew that I was watching him. God, Danielle, you scared the crap out of me, he said. I knew that he didn't expect to see me because he tried not to swear when I could hear her, but he did it twice. Also, he was dragging a heavy load and a white sheet that looked like it had blood on it. It was dark in the kitchen, but there was enough light coming through the open basement door to make it pretty unmistakable. I woke up to get a glass of water, I explained. What are you taking downstairs? He looked down at the long, heavy object that was wrapped in the sheet. Um, it's a new carpet. For the basement? Yes. We don't have carpet in the basement. Which is why we need this one. Go to bed, Danielle. It's a school night. I was pretty sure that he was lying about the carpet. Like, almost completely certain. Parents think they can get away with lying to their kids all the time. Because they forget that growing means losing what we used to believe. And we're growing all the time. I tried very hard to listen to what was happening in the basement. But my bedroom was on the second floor and I couldn't hear a sound. Which is much worse than knowing everything. I got home from school at 3.45 every day. And dad never came back from work until after 6. I didn't want to check the basement alone. But we all do things that we don't want to do. Sometimes it feels like we don't have a choice, even when we're the ones acting. The basement is unpleasant. It's dark even when I pull the chain hanging from the ceiling to turn on the single bulb. We have to walk down the stairs with only the light from the kitchen. It's cold and it smells like bleach. I don't know why we have basements, which hold the stuff that we never use. Dad should have just thrown away the workbenches, the barrels, and the tools that he told me not to ask about. I'm not sure what I was looking for, but I hoped that I wouldn't find it. The concrete floor was clean, very clean, but the stands on the workbench had always been there. The basement still had no carpet. I bent down to search the floor. The coldness rose up from the ground and made me shiver as I got on my hands and knees but the floor was spotless. If I was going to find anything, it had to be around hidden corners, and it had to be now. Daddy wouldn't be happy if he knew that I was in the basement, so I could only do this once. I pulled back a dirty sheet that was draped over a bench and I reached my hand into the darkness. I felt something. Dragging my hand out, I kept the objects covered, not wanting to know. And then I heard a car pulling into the driveway. Mom was home and time was up. So I scooped the objects and held them close. They were teeth. Grown up teeth. Because they had some silver parts like daddy has. I felt ashamed when I looked at them. They reminded me of how far from normal I really was. I slid the teeth back behind the sheet and I ran into the kitchen before mom got inside. Not knowing is worse than anything. Dad sat on my bed and kissed my forehead when I went to sleep, just like he always did. I was relaxed and safe when I felt his weight on the side of my mattress. But we all want our innocence broken, otherwise we would keep it forever. That's why I was hiding behind the sheet in the basement after he put me to sleep. I didn't want to be alone in the dark. And I didn't like knowing the teeth were on the ground next to me. But daddy clearly didn't check that corner so it was the safest place to hide. Staying quiet in a dark place is the best way to hear voices. Mom says that it isn't ghosts and that it's just our imagination going wild when all distractions are gone. But that just proves that she doesn't know what ghosts really are. My jeans and sweater didn't keep me warm. I couldn't stop shivering and I wanted to leave. But then the basement door opened and I really wanted to leave, but it was too late. Our desire is always the strongest in the moment that we realize something familiar has become out of reach. Step, thunk, step, thunk, step, thunk. Dad was dragging something heavy down the stairs, 
Click. I blinked as the light bulb shined dimly through the sheet. I assumed Daddy's eyes wouldn't be immediately adjusted, so I peeked into the room. He was kneeling over another sheet wrapped a bundle in the ground. This one was also bloody. He was sweaty and nervous as he unwrapped it. I had never seen a dead body before, but I knew right away that she wasn't alive. Her skin was the pale color of uncooked mushrooms, and her arms flopped like spaghetti instead of something alive. I wanted to look away so badly. I didn't look away though. Daddy pulled out the saw that spins around in a circle, and I knew that things were about to get gross. I was so disappointed in him. And then her arm moved. The woman's face was still dead, but I watched her fingers squirm like worms coming up from the ground after rain. Daddy didn't notice right away. Things might have been different if he had. He was examining the saw when her arm lifted high. It grabbed his throat like a snake that I had once watched eating a mouse. He dropped the saw and squeezed her hand until his fingers had turned white. But it didn't do any good. I felt like my entire body was in dried cement. I couldn't help him, and I couldn't turn away. I wanted to puke. Her arms came alive as Dad slapped her arm, his lips becoming blue while his tongue bulged. The blood vessels in his eyes changed to pink and then splotchy, and then the white turned red. He got weaker as the punches turned into gentle little slaps and then he stopped moving. I squeaked. The woman dropped my dad to the floor, and he landed like spaghetti. And then she sat up, pulled the sheet off her body, and turned around. She was completely naked, and every part of her skin was pale. I wondered if ghosts are white because dead people sometimes have no blood in them. Our brains form weird thoughts during the most shocking moments. She stood, walked over to my hiding place and knelt down. I scooted back, convincing myself that I would be safe as long as I moved to the darkest corner. That works when we're hiding under the covers in our beds, so I decided it would do just as well here. It didn't work. She pulled back the sheet and stared at me as I stared right back. It may have been my very first time seeing a dead person. But I understood enough to know that, that she was still dead, no matter how much she was walking around. I stared back at eyes that couldn't blink. I breathed and she didn't. I wanted to run away, but I was cornered. I shook. You feel alone, she said, but her voice was all wrong. You're not alone. You never are. And then the woman reached out a rubbery hand and cupped my face. Her fingers were like ice, but I was afraid to fight back. It felt like my teeth were vomiting, but I couldn't stop them as my fangs cut through my gums and exposed themselves to the world. I hated it and I was ashamed, because they reminded me of how far from normal I really was. Welcome to the night. She whispered as my first tears fell. Now, she continued, looking behind her, there are several options for your father. Are you ready to find out who you really are? I stared at the naked woman who had just killed my father, unable to pin down my emotions, still very confused that she could talk to me despite being dead. What do you mean about options for my father? I breathed, feeling like I was watching myself from above. My daddy's dead, right? The woman folded her pale arms. I could see the veins just under her skin. Spider webbing throughout her body like blue tree roots wrapped in rice paper. Dead doesn't mean what people think, Danielle. Her voice sounded sticky like mud as she narrowed her eyes at me. If a person's soul can birth into this world where there had previously been nothing, don't you realize that it can go somewhere else when nothing returns? I don't know. 
I answered honestly. It felt like my voice was coming from underwater. Are you going to kill me now too? She reached out and lifted my lips. Her fingers were cold, not ice cold, but more like a dead fish that hasn't quite started to sing. You always knew what was hidden inside, didn't you? Even if you had never seen them, part of you knew what was there. I slid my tongue absently across the fangs that had erupted from my gums. The woman narrowed her cerulean eyes at me. We don't kill our own. And then she bared her teeth. Two poisonous looking fangs dripped from her gums, curving into serpentine points. Come with me, Danielle. I will show you something different from what you've known or what you thought was possible. I looked down on my father's crooked form. He hated bad posture, and it looked so wrong to see him so still, and my cheeks got hot as my head spun. And then the woman was holding my face close to hers. There's yet time for me to accept the turn. I'll do it, but only if you ask, Danielle. What do you want for your father? We don't grow up all at once. It happens in fits and starts, and never when we're ready. Age can only change us when our spirit is no longer fit for the world that we knew. I tried to turn away, but she wouldn't let me. Do what it takes to keep him here, I whispered. The woman stared at me harder, and it felt like she was scraping the back of my skull with her eyes. Death is natural. What you're about to see isn't. What has been done can never be undone. Do you understand? No, I answered, my head slumping. Oh, good. She let go of me. Anyone who answers yes to that question is insane. The woman turned around and paused while facing my dad, and then she slowly stepped toward him, her bare feet padding softly against the concrete floor. I felt guilty about the fact that there were only wrong choices before me. Oh, what are you going to do? I heaved, preparing to intervene. Oh, stop asking questions to which you already know the answers, Danielle. You're 12 years old. My stomach burned like it did the time that I ate too many deviled eggs that had been sitting in the sun. I fell to my knees. The dead woman knelt as well, hovering over my dad, her fangs extending even lower as they elongated past her bottom lap. Wait, I called out, but it was too late. We always like trying to stop things after it's too late, because that makes us feel like the world isn't what we make of it. Her fangs sunk deep into my daddy's neck with a splurge. The room felt like it was dancing from side to side as I held back the vomit. The dead woman pulled like she was sucking deeply from a straw. Her eyes rolled back as they bulged turning into veiny orbs that protruded menacingly from her sunken white face. She rose up, lifting my dad's neck with her. His body shuddered, and then his skin turned a slightly darker tannish shade. Dad squeezed a fist, and then the woman released her mouth as Daddy fell to the ground and shook. Her eyes swiveled in their sockets before sitting on me once more. She heaved, catching her breath while we stared at one another. He might rise, she gasped. He might not. Daddy's fist clenched again. But we can't wait to find out. She stood and stepped across my father's body, reaching her hand toward me. I didn't take it. Will things ever be normal again? Now that she had blood in her system, the woman seemed capable of emotion. I'm sorry, Danielle, but this was always going to happen to you. The only question was the timing. I looked past her knees. I want to see if Daddy wakes up. She bent down and took my hand by force. No, you don't. 
I wouldn't have believed that I was going to leave my father behind, but my legs seemed to carry me on their own accord. I followed the woman in a daze as we left the mess on our floor, and she led me up the 19 steps of my family's basement for the last time. You'll be 13 soon, she explained as we walked out of the back door and into the chilly night. Old enough to know the truth. She squeezed my hand tighter. I pulled back. I want to go home, I protested. She turned sharply around to face me. Danielle, where do you think I'm taking you? Digging my heels into the grass, I tried to break free, but she was too strong, and it didn't matter how hard I clutched the ground. The woman floated up above me, legs hanging down as gravity released its hold on her. I wasn't ready to fly, but it was too late. She pulled my wrist after her, and my feet left the grass as my shoulders screamed in pain, the muscles stretching like taffy. As I rose into the air and flew past my childhood home into the night sky, the most shocking thing about flying was that it wasn't shocking at all. While the dead woman lifted above my backyard fence, pulling me behind her, the sensation felt natural. I watched as my shoes floated over the bushes as we floated into the night. I was afraid for my dad, and afraid of him. I didn't want him to be dead or undead or whatever the woman's bite had done to him. But every emotion climbed on top of itself as they screamed for my attention. They cancelled themselves out, leaving me feeling completely numb as we all drifted. Can't you fly any higher? I asked her. I didn't want to look directly at the woman, because her naked and dead body had scared me. My hands were as cold as ice, far colder than any hand should be. No, she responded. I know you must have concerns, but... You need to wait until we return to my congregation. Adults often answer questions by saying things that just raise more questions. Sometimes, it's easier not to say anything in response and let a person feel like they're right. We floated through the night, and I felt like I was floating through it. The night became a physical presence, like water that I could drink or swim in. I was almost surprised when we stopped moving. We had landed in front of a large mansion with no lights on. We stood in thick, dewy grass that felt alive and dead at the same time. I thought about asking the woman if she was cold, but I suppose you don't care about a lot of things when you're dead. Let's go, Danielle, she whispered. The woman pulled my hand, which was still resting in hers. It's time for you to return home. A sudden jolt of fear ripped through my arm and stuck into my chest as I followed her forward. I didn't want to go in, but I couldn't think of any other option, so I obeyed. The house swallowed a noise. We walked up the front steps and through the door, and into a dark entryway with only the pale moon to guide us. Our footsteps made no sound as she led me around a hallway and to an open door. Light but no warmth radiated from the bottom of the staircase before us. Fear clutched my stomach and snaked up through my throat in the form of a green nausea as for the first time I tried to pull away. Her icy grip held firm. You need to do this, Danielle, she ordered. The woman moved down the first step, pulling me unwillingly after her. Each step felt worse. I knew that I didn't want to see what was at the bottom of the stairs, but I also knew that I didn't have a choice. I held my breath at the bottom before moving around the corner, telling myself that there was no way it could be as bad as I was setting it up in my mind. I was wrong. A ring of ghoulish-looking men and women huddled in a circle at the center of the stone-walled basement, each holding a flickering candle that made their pale skin look waxy. Several more candles sat throughout the room, 
providing the only source of light. Sitting in the middle of the group was a shirtless man kneeling on the floor, with his hands bound behind his back. His brown hair and beard displayed widely about his face. The man's head was bent forward, but he stared up with an angry defiance. Directly across from me, one pale man lifted his arms in greeting. Welcome, Danielle, to Amenity Falls. I'm so glad that you're finally where you belong. My stomach lurched as I stared at him. His voice was somehow low and high at the same time, a sliding, discomforting kind of fear on my spine. His most unsettling feature, however, was his eyes. They were pink. I am Kadavru, he announced. We've been waiting a long time to meet you, Danielle. More than anyone, Brooke here has been anticipating your encounter. The bound man grunted but did not budge. The woman finally released me and stepped toward the group. We both understood that I wouldn't run away. You have done everything expected and more, Gita. Kadavru commended as one of the pale women placed a black robe around her, and then he turned to face me. We're looking forward to great things, Danielle. I wanted to cry, puke, and hide, but I couldn't do any of those things. At least 19 pairs of eyes stared at me, and I knew that they could fly up the 13 steps before I got anywhere near the door. Nothing to say, Kadavru pressed. Very well. Your actions will do the speaking for you. The crowd drew back at his words, extending the circle to the stone edges of the basement. Only the kneeling man in the center remained in place. Are you ready? Kadavru hissed, smiling in a way that made me unhappy. No, I finally announced to the room. I don't know what's going on and I, I think I want to go home. You are home, Danielle. Droned a pale woman from my right. She's correct, a child, Kadav reprised, his inexplicably pink eyes boring into me. You can't escape this. I wiped my eye. I can't escape what? I mumbled, not wanting to know the answer. Kadavru stared at me a moment longer before, drawing a knife and approaching the kneeling man, broke from behind. My breath stopped as he raised the knife and slashed. Brooke's arm burst forth as he leapt to his feet, the now severed rope falling to the floor. Kadavru backed away with a sinister smile. Brooke looked around wildly, like an animal trapped in a cage, at the people encircling him. I stepped back, pressing my arms against the cold stone wall. Brooke is the reason that Gita ended up in your father's basement. He's also the reason that she will never see her daughter again. Brooke whipped around to stare at Kadavru, looking ready to murder him. Danielle, the moment is right and the man is right. We're excited to share this with you. He grinned, lifting his arms. Welcome to your first kill. We're prohibited from experiencing certain things at age 12. Kids hate that fact. But when the strange man told me that it was time for my first kill, I finally understood that grating phrase, you're not old enough yet, can make a lot of sense. Brooke turned around and scowled at Kadavru. This is why, he heaved. This is exactly why you're filth. Every one of you, he spat. It's too cowardly to face me unless it's twenty to one. And even then, even then, you're afraid of me. And send a little girl to do it. His breathing was very heavy. You're nothing but trash and I'll happily give my life to keep good people from being poisoned by trash. That's why the world is better off without her daughter. He finished with a whisper, pointing at Gita. In the frozen silence that followed... The only movement was the torchlight dancing on the man's bare sweaty chest. And then Gita screamed and ran toward him, her robes flowing behind as she bared her vicious fangs.
What happened next was so quick that I had to replay it in my mind three times before I understood what had happened. Brooke leaned toward her before quickly drawing back as Gita opened her mouth. He leapt into an uppercut that plowed directly into her now exposed neck. The punch was powerful enough to lift her up off the ground. His gut kick was waiting as she landed. Gita collapsed to the floor, struggling to breathe. You're a coward, Brooke yelled, pointing at Kadavru. He took several bold steps through the middle of the circle, closing the gap between them. And if I'm going to die here, it's going to be fighting against him. Bah! Kadavru grabbed Brooke by his neck and lifted the muscular man with a single arm. Brooke kicked frantically, but his boots were two feet off the ground. Kadavru inspected him with a curious look, as though he were holding a particularly interesting coin up to the light. I have no particular need for the two of us to spar, he explained in a calm voice. You would already be dead otherwise. He dropped Brooke to the ground with a sound like ten melons falling at once. Brooke struggled to pull an air while failing to draw himself into a kneeling position. Nearby, Gita was on her hands and knees, staring in hate as she slowly regained her breath. A chill ran through me as I looked across at Kadavru, who stood over the group without any hint of emotion or movement. You're wasting your time in fighting the inevitable hunter, he explained in the same deep and controlled voice. You can resist what's foregone or you can do what you've come here to do. And Brooke rolled his head to face his enemy, and then Kadavru pulled something from inside his robes and dropped it to the stone floor with a clatter. One wooden stake, 19.13 inches, carved to your exact specifications, he explained. You can have it if you face the task for which you have been brought here. Electric chills flared in my hips, buzzing on my neck and back, before curling around my ears and settling in my head as every face turned toward me. I snapped around to check the staircase, but three pale, robed figures moved to block it. And then I looked again to Brooke. He met my eyes, and it was enough to know that he hated me before he knew me. Fine, he announced, reaching for the stake without breaking his gaze. If you're vile enough to want me to murder your children, that's where I'll start. I wanted to cry. I wanted to explain that I wasn't one of them. That everyone clearly hated me equally that it wasn't fair to pull me into a world filled with purposeless anger, where I had nothing to gain from winning a fight. But I understood the truth as Brooke rose to his feet, continuing to glare at me with hatred that I had no hope of understanding. Angry people cannot win fights by hearty people they oppose. Their only concept of victory is to destroy the faith of those who believe that Conflicts can be resolved without pain. Please stop. I squeaked as the robed figures parted to give Brooke access to me. He looked down on me with joy. My breath hitched as I realized that he could choose to stop himself, but he simply wouldn't do so as long as he was alive. He raised the stake as he stepped in front of me. We all have pieces of ourselves that float around unused, like books high atop forgotten shelves, until the strangest turn of fate makes us pull them out and see what's inside. I felt another piece of me, a hidden Danielle, squirming to get free. Brooke reached for me with his left hand as he lifted his right one higher, and something snapped, and the inner Danielle jumped into my skin. My fangs erupted as I jumped at Brooke, suddenly confident and very angry as I focused on the hand coming toward me. I took it into my mouth and bit down in red fury, the hand bone snapping like little twigs as my teeth sunk deep into his meat. He flinched like a jolt of electricity had shot through him. The stake momentarily stopped. Now hurt, Brooke swung it again as I pulled deeply at the flavorful blood in his hand. He froze. I pulled again, drinking the essence of his life and 
He dropped the steak to the ground as his eyes sunk into their sockets. I drank it again and his skin melted against his bones, his face not little more than a fleshy skull. Pulling one more time, I watched his skin turn ashen gray as his lips disappeared. His neck, now little more than deflated flesh, was unable to support a head that rolled back like rotten fruit. I released his hand and pulled my head back while pushing against his frail frame. Now little more than a skeleton, I tossed the body lightly aside. It crashed to the floor with a weak clatter, the sound of tinkling teeth scattering to the edges of the dark room. I felt good. I felt alive. Nineteen sets of eyes gazed at me, but no one said a word. It was Kadavru who finally broke the silence, but he remained pressed against the wall as he spoke. A little girl, he gasped. What kind of monster are you? Our sense of right and wrong is mostly determined by the passions of those who happen to be standing nearby. So as I gazed at the 19 sets of menacing eyes while I backed into a stone wall, I truly felt that I was the one in the wrong, even though I didn't understand why. Why did you bring her here, Kadavru? One of them asked in a terrified voice. She doesn't belong with us. I didn't want them to see me cry. She's crying, another called out. She knows that she's a freak. I don't, I whispered. You're the ones who brought me. I pressed my back against the cold rock of the basement wall, trying to grab onto anything but coming up empty handed. The crowd formed a semicircle around me so that I couldn't see them all at once, no matter how quickly I glanced in every direction. Their ghost-like faces were even more sinister in the dancing torchlight. We're not safe with her around, another announced. A sob escaped my lips despite my best efforts to hold it back. I was the only one to be attacked. She doesn't understand. A man's deep voice called out. We can't explain it to someone who doesn't already believe us. And Gita had recovered from her attack and gotten to her feet, enjoying the crowd. She stepped to the middle of the semicircle and plucked something from the ground. It was the wooden stake that Brooke had used to attack me. It sometimes can be difficult to do the right thing. She breathed, her knuckles flexing around the weapon. But we need to keep our community safe. I nearly fell over as the images of the night flew through my mind. Gita's limp alabaster body on my basement floor. Brooke dissolved into dust by my actions. My father somewhere between alive and dead left behind as I was whisked away. I didn't want any of this, I whimpered. I'm only 12. That just proves how dangerous she is, another man called out. Something broke inside of my mind just then. I had always believed that right and wrong were clear lines that any level-headed person could see if they chose to do so. In that moment, however, I realized that we all choose to imagine the boundary with whatever hindsight makes us most comfortable, and we see violence as a way of correcting the existence of those who prove that morality is retroactive, and I remembered that I had teeth. I looked at the Gita's a twisted sneer as she gazed at me in unmitigated disgust. I felt her hate and I reflected it back. I had never learned how to pull my fangs out, but instinct guided me as I dropped them down and hissed. She let go of her stake and staggered back. Adrenaline flowed through me as I realized that I didn't have to hate myself as much as they hated me. I might even be able to run out of the basement if I could just get past the crowd. Turning to the steps leading out of this place, I gauged the strength of those who stood in my way. They all scurried aside before I could form another thought. They were afraid of me. I loved and hated myself for understanding this fact. That paradox mixed with the decision that I didn't want to make, but I had to act on immediately, racing up the stairs I could save myself. But it would also require embracing the ugliness of believing that I was at my best when feeling like a living pestilence. 
The alternative was to let them hurt me, which has a hypnotic appeal when you're made to feel that our spirits are intrinsically disgusting. All of this was felt with emotions and no words. It would take years to articulate even to myself what I had experienced in that moment. I hated myself and I ran. Up the stairs, into the hall and out the front door and into the night. The frigid air wrapped me tight and I hadn't dressed for the occasion and I was cold. I didn't understand what had happened, but I knew that I was alone. With no cell phone and no idea where I was, I wandered. I lost a lot of things that night, some all at once and others bit by bit as I traversed an unfamiliar city. I had always believed that life had strict boundaries and that certain lines could never be crossed. One of those false convictions was that someone would always take care of me, but passing street after street in the unforgiving chill had stripped that away. I cried. I was at the intersection of 19th and 13th when I decided that anyone who really cared about me would have been by my side while I was alone. And then I turned to the left and saw myself reflected in a store window. For the first time in hours, I smiled. It revealed two tiny things when I took the time to look hard enough. The sun was almost ready to peek over the gray sky morning when I finally recognized the street that I had been walking. Without thinking, I headed towards home. Every contradicting emotion ran through me at once. Above them all was a single thought. I had left my father behind on the floor. Shouldn't he treat me the same way? Anxiety swirled with adrenaline to curdle into nausea that settled deep in my stomach as I placed my hand on the back doorknob. I had last seen my father dead on the ground. Maybe. So much of this night had been driven by the fact that I had to make decisions about my life without understanding what was happening or why. I closed my eyes and reminded myself that one day I would be an adult and I would never have to feel that way again. I opened the door and walked into the house. It was very still like the place had been abandoned. Nervousness flowed through me as I stepped toward the basement door. It stood slightly ajar. Had we left it open, I couldn't remember. My hands were shaking as I reached out and opened it. The basement was quiet. Nausea grew with each step. Did I want to see my father's body? Or was I hoping to see him alive, even though he would be in a certain agony? I didn't know what to hope. I took the last step into the basement, and then I turned a corner, looked down at the bloodstained floor, and gasped. Imagine how a body looks when a victim dies in pain. Can you see the fear in their glazed eyes? The way their mouth is frozen in a wide open, permanent scream as rigor mortis sets in. Their narrowed fingers forever locked in the last failed attempt to end their pain. Now imagine that person as someone that you loved. My father was still recognizable, but his body was far enough removed from normal that everything in the world felt off kilter. It would have been better if he were marred beyond recognition, but the semi-familiarity made it so much worse. Like I was listening to a soothing and familiar music played out of tune in the wrong key. Daddy's eyes stared up at me from the basement floor. I remember staring at his skin and thinking that it was the color of paper, far beyond the hue of any normal tone. The look on his body's face was clear. He could see the end coming and he wanted to reach for it. All of the aspirations for the second half of his life were worth destroying if it meant stopping the pain. I couldn't put all of this into words when I was 12. The emotions were specific, but beyond my ability to articulate. I can share them now because I've relived those moments daily in the years since, and I had to put the voice to the feelings if I wanted to keep my sanity. The image of my dead father broke something in my mind. Watching his corpse stand up sent that fissure into the deepest part of me, cracking my spirit and leaving it unfixable. 
What happened, Danielle? He whispered. His voice sounded like dust blowing over rice paper. What did I lose? I wanted to help him stand, but I was afraid of my corpse dad. So I tried as he slowly and feebly got to his feet, grasping the hand rail for support as he looked around the basement with wide eyes. My throat was nearly too dry to speak. You died, daddy. He looked down at me, not in confusion or in anger, but sadness. He stepped forward like Frankenstein's monster and I recoiled in fear. He saw that he was scaring me, but he didn't know how to stop it. So we just stared at each other ashamed. You didn't tell me the truth, I whispered. Are you really my dad? He was quiet for a long while. The tears forming at the edges of his eyes marked the first time that I had ever seen him cry. I wasn't your dad when you were born, Danielle. I'm only your dad now if you let me. I didn't know what to say. What am I? He swayed on his feet. Something I was taught all my life that I needed to hate. I nodded. It made sense because it was the opposite of everything that I had ever known, which is exactly how this entire night had been. My family is composed of hunters, and we've always hated vamps because they killed so many of the people that we loved. Our only response was to eradicate them. Is that how they saw you? My voice sounded like it was coming from underwater. I suppose I never really thought about it. He wobbled again. My dad's face was still paper white. Your mom and I had a little girl before you were born. The vamps got to her at her first birthday party, January 9th, 13 years ago. It changed the way that I understand sadness, Danielle. Everything bad that had happened to me before losing my first daughter, pain as a concept had always been sadness that arose from, hoping things might return to normal. But losing a child meant accepting that life simply can't be normal again. Ever. Pain doesn't work the same way afterward, because hope is dead. He wiped his eyes again. I noticed that they were turning pink. So I made a decision. We didn't speak for at least a minute. I could feel the quiet hanging thick between us like heavy swamp moss that dangled in clumps from when dad took us on a trip to Louisiana when I was 10. It was hard to breathe there too. I took a little girl from one of them, figured that killing her was too easy. No, I was going to do worse, so much worse. I would raise her to be like me, to hunt them without mercy. When they saw one of their own turned, I knew they would finally be broken like I was. My insides felt like concrete. Dad cried harder. Two things happened. The first is that I discovered the little girl wasn't a vamp like the rest of them. She didn't feed the same way, didn't have the same hunger. The congregation would hate her even more than our hunters, because she was an abomination in their eyes. The second is that the broken piece of me the one that had stopped hoping had shifted again. It didn't reset to the way things had once been. That's impossible. But the hate that had been burning for so long, that had kept me going forward. It wasn't satisfied, but it just sort of ran out of fuel. I became a less efficient hunter, so I didn't fight as much. As a result, I wasn't with the rest of my gathering on the night that they were ambushed. I was taking care of my little girl while her mom was away. I think the other hunters chose that night because I would be gone, since I was losing my edge. Good thing I never told them my plan to raise a vamp, because they had solved the problem in their own way. He sighed. It was a hollow, ringing sound, like wind rushing through an abandoned home. When four of them died in a single night, I withdrew. I didn't hunt at all for a while and I realized that I didn't miss it. Didn't miss the fire that had been burning me every day. I knew the truth had to come out eventually. 
and I knew that Vamp and Tuncher alike would see my daughter as a target when that day came. But she was the best thing in my world, so I decided to live the best life we could with the time that we had left. He stopped at talking and he looked at me. I stared right back. So, he asked, his voice nearly caught in a sob. What do we do now? I stared at my father, neither alive nor dead, watching him sway on his feet. Our minds go to strange places in the most intense moments of our lives. I remember how drafty the basement was. I was tired but didn't want to sleep. A pain stain in the ground consumed my attention as I thought about the fact that it had always been there, but I had never taken the time to consider how it had come to be. Danielle, Dad whispered. I looked up at his paperweight skin, mired only by two puncture marks in his neck where livid red blood sparkled beneath the sodium lights. I remembered a line from a play that my teacher had tried to explain to us. Too early seen unknown and known too late. After asking the class what it meant, and then receiving no response, she just looked sad and put her big red book away. She never mentioned it again. I think a lot of adults are like that. They want to share something very personal and special, but they spend their lives in silence, waiting for somebody to ask in just the right way. I don't know why I thought of that line, but it made sense for just a few seconds. Danielle, he breathed again. Do you hate me? I didn't know what to say, and I know that my silence hurt him. He was just starting to cry when the window broke. Dad ran forward and yanked me away from the steps as we had the upstairs window slide open. Danielle, he hissed, don't make a sound. Footsteps paced across the floor directly above our heads as a man stalked deliberately toward the basement door. I held my breath as I realized that there was no place to run or to hide. The basement was a dead end. Dad squeezed my shoulders with ice cold hands. Slowly, the door at the top of the stairs opened. Hello, Danielle, a gravelly voice called, and then he started walking down the steps. Dad pulled me back toward the far wall, moving himself in front of me as we watched a shadow emerge. It was a tall man with long, flowing brown hair. His teeth were very white when he smiled. He seemed like the sort of person who was happiest when he was angry. True, Dad announced in a shaky voice. It's been some time. True cocked his head at my father. Yes, and now that we've caught up, we need to talk about Danielle. Dad's entire body froze. How did you know? Our connection at the congregation felt that this was worth sharing. True answered dismissively. He flexed his fists, making the muscles in his chest look like they were about to tear through his tight black shirt. You're far, far beyond sloppy at this point. Your failure endangers the rest of the gathering. He pulled out a long, thin, and wooden spike. I came as quick as I could. You raised her as a human daughter. You shouldn't have to be the one to do it. Every skin cell felt like it was being burnt off my body. Until that night, I would have never thought my daddy was capable of killing anyone, let alone me. But as I looked back on what both of us had done in the past few hours, I realized that we're all strangers to each other because we were all strangers to ourselves. Essen, he pressed, addressing my father by name for the first time. You shouldn't have to be the one to do it. True walked towards us, and then my dad stepped to the side, exposing me to the man who looked so happy to be so hateful. My head spun like a top. I didn't move because I had been so sure that my dad would protect me, because dads are supposed to keep their daughters safe, and I was so shaken by the abandonment that I couldn't think of a single way to react other than freezing in place and waiting for him to hurt me. True's grip was like a metal clamp. I tried to move only when it was too late. His smile grew wider as he felt me struggle. 
Helplessness leads to panic and leads to helplessness, and the cycle is quick. I smacked his hand as hard as I could, but that just brought him more joy. Do you know why our stakes are exactly 19.13 inches? It's a very important number. He asked, holding the pointed stick up to my face. I cried. His grab snapped away quickly as his hands grabbed a throat that had just split like the doughy skin of a dumpling. I was confused at first because I had never seen somebody's neck eaten while they were still alive, and I didn't know that my father had fangs. True fought back long after his body was no longer worth saving. Dad drank his blood like a thirsty athlete, gulping it down in disgusting swags. And then he opened his mouth and released True, who bounced on the floor like a rag doll. Dad grabbed the wooden stake from the ground and plunged it into True's heart with a squelch. He gasped for breath. I stared down numb. Dad, I whispered, did I just grow up? He looked up at me in shame, his hollow, ice blue eyes animalistic. Are you sad? I tried to swallow but my throat was too dry. Sad and confused. He nodded. The answer is yes, just a little bit. We waited in silence. We're not safe here, are we? I finally asked. We're not safe anywhere, Danielle. He wiped the blood from his mouth and tears from his eyes. I will be sorry for the rest of my life, he stood. The blood dripped from his chin. So, he asked, his voice wary. Do you want to know the truth? The air felt heavy in my lungs like everything around me was grittier and always would be. No, I answered. I don't want to know the truth. I wiped my eyes, but I have to now. Dad stepped toward me and wrapped me in a soft hug. It was the gentlest touch that I had felt from him since that horrible night began. He kissed the top of my head and pulled me in close. I hugged him back, but there was a great distance between us that I incoherently believed was temporary. Growing up usually isn't fun, Dad said as he released me. I suppose that's why parents hide it from their children for as long as they can. I stared around at the stark basement, the bright lights and the blood on the ground. Oh, well, we have to run away, I asked. My voice sounded like it was coming from another room. Dad wiped his eye. Yeah, he folded his arms. And I don't think I'll be able to go with you. My stomach turned cold. Like every organ, it changed to stone at that exact same time. Dad looked at me but didn't face me. I achieved my first kill at 19. Because I had been planning for it since I was 13. Danielle, when you believe in a cause, it has a way of becoming its own justification. Even when that cause works against the things that led you to it in the first place. He shuffled his feet around at Trues, spreading blood. Our gathering, that's the name for a group of vamp hunters, made a deal with a very dangerous man. He gave us information and money to help us hunt. It was never enough to give us what we wanted, but always just sufficient to get him what he needed. We took it because we believed that we were right. He wiped his other eye. I convinced myself that he wasn't doing the exact same thing for the congregation. That's a group of vamps that we were hunting. I had to make myself think that, because I knew the truth would destroy my belief system, and I had already hurt too many people to question whether I was wrong. He squatted next to True and rested his hand on the man's bloody brown hair. Why was the dangerous man giving you money if he was tricking you? Dad smiled and I had never seen him look so sad. That's the best way to control someone, Danielle. I didn't understand. Who is he? Dad slowly turned to face me. Now the stare to Laura. Remember his name, Danielle, because he already knows yours. A finger of hot nausea tickled the back of my throat. Why would he care about knowing the little girl's name? Dad's lips drew thin as he stood. 
It doesn't matter that you're a little girl. If you have something that he wants, then you're just an obstacle. He ran his fingers through thinning hair. I always knew that, I always saw it, but I chose to pretend that I didn't. People who make those mistakes are rarely the ones to pay for them. I'm so sorry, Danielle. So, let me get this straight. I shot back, my eyes suddenly molten hot. The hunters want to hurt me because they think I'm a vamp. The vamps want to hurt me because they think that I'm not. And the dangerous man is coming for me because I'm in the middle. The heat spread across my face. I felt like I was melting from the inside out, and that everybody would be happier if I had dissolved into nothing. In that moment, I was sure that the world wouldn't be at peace until I decided to stop loving myself. Dad turned paler. He handed me the bloody steak which I took in shaking hands. I didn't want it, but I was sure that I had no choice. What will the bad man do if he finds me? Dad turned away. I don't know. I made a decision to remain ignorant. He folded his arms. There are more special people all over the world. The man is very interested in special women and girls. He swallowed. The hair on my neck stood at attention as I felt fingers curl around my ankle. I looked down to see that True was not quite dead. The stake was in his heart before I realized that I was bending over to attack him. I noticed that my fingers were coated in blood and that the wooden tip had disappeared into his chest and that the grip on my ankle had slackened. Attacking him didn't feel unnatural. I decided that the world might be right. Perhaps it wouldn't be happy until I no longer loved myself, but I didn't owe happiness to the world. If taking as much for myself meant misery for others, then they deserved the rottenness that they wanted to spread. I lacked the ability to articulate any of this at age 12, but I understood it was true without the phrasing being necessary. Most people are afraid of arranging exact words in a perfect order, because we can only endure our own minds when shrouded in at least a little bit of mystery. I stood. What does he do with these special women and girls? I breathed, distantly shocked at how steady my own voice sounded. Dad got paler. They're brought to a place called the Harlequin Heaven. No one taken there ever leaves. That's all I know. I rub my fingers around the slick blood coating my fingertips. When are they coming for me? The sound of a car racing down the street swept into the basement, loud enough for us to feel the urgency in the driver's effort. Danielle, Dad snapped, grabbing my wrist. We have to run. I sprinted up the basement stairs without waiting for an explanation from my father. So many different people wanted to hurt me that it was safer to assume every stranger was an enemy. The van screeched to a halt just outside of our front door. The sound was loud enough to communicate exactly what was unfolding even though I couldn't see it. A heavy man leapt onto the sidewalk and raced toward the house. And the only way out of the basement was moving upward and closer to the front door. Have you ever been forced to run from danger by running toward it? Our survival instinct stretches and cracks in those moments, pushed and pulled by contradictory messages between our higher and lower brains. But I knew that moving too slowly would be a final mistake, so I sprinted to the top of the stairs and pushed open the door. A thin, pale man was waiting for me. Danielle, he whispered as the man outside slammed against the front door. Please, I gasped. Please move. There's a man who wants to hurt me. There are many men who want to hurt you. He answered in a steady voice. The front door slammed again as the thin man reached for me. Dad shoved me hard against the wall and tackled the pale man as the front door burst open. The two of them rolled on the floor, each bearing a vicious looking set of fangs. They stopped with Dad on the bottom, his enemy's hands wrapped around his neck. What did you think those teeth would do, Wesson? The pale man smiled as he stepped behind him. You can't hurt me with a bite, but I can make you suffer by squeezing a throat that will never die. He hissed as he grabbed Dad's neck even tighter, his face turning bright red. Dad made silent eye contact with me as the pale man continued talking. 
You can't see more than one step ahead, SN. And that's why your daughter won't. Dad burst forward and knocked the pale man onto the stake that I had pointed against his back. The weapon ripped through his chest with a splorch that seemed to surprise him more than anything else. Blood gushing down his chest. The pale man looked back at me in confusion before rolling off my father. Dad gasped for breath as the other man walked into the kitchen. He seemed nine feet tall and bearded and thick, more animal than human. My survival instinct kicked into high gear. I knew that he was here to take me to the man that Dad had warned me about, and that I would have been safer if we had just let the vamp kill me. Understanding hit me in an instant. Both a hunter and a vamp had appeared minutes apart from each other and alone. Such an arrangement meant that they wouldn't fight one another, and they wouldn't have the numbers to take me. But it would be just enough to slow us down so that this towering behemoth could have his way in the end. They had been sacrificed by a man who knew how to use his pawns. Time ticked sideways. I looked down from the stranger to my father, and I understood what was about to happen. I knew that he would overpower the two of us even with our fangs, and that this fight was over before it began. Now I know what's in room 1913 SN, the large man said. Dad closed his eyes and took a long breath before looking at me. For a few moments, every sound ceased except for my father's voice. He stared up from the floor, eyes bloodshot and face still red, too exhausted to cry. Danielle, if you've ever loved me, don't stop running. He sprang to his feet and lunged at the enormous man. Dad's face met a plate-sized fist that knocked him to his knees. Dad couldn't win this fight, but if he fought to the end, it would be enough to give me a 30-second head start. Would you run away? I thought that I would need a long time to consider her but it turns out that we really know the answers to even the most painful questions. It just takes time to admit them. I turned and sprinted toward the back door, bursting through it as Dad screamed. I ran. I ran until my lungs burned and my veins pumped battery acid, and I didn't stop for a very long time. I knew that the world could hurt me because I could hurt it right back, and I could look at that fact from any angle that I chose. I never saw my father again. I knew it even then, but wouldn't believe it for a long time. The large man, however, would reappear several times in my life. I was a freak, but everybody's a freak from someone else's perspective, and feeling normal is just a lack of self-awareness. Tears flowed freely as I raced into the night. This was dad's fault. All parents fail their children in ways that will follow them forever. I suppose that's the only reason we can beg forgiveness from our own children. My ugliness kept me alive by hurting anyone who felt normal through hating me, and each encounter pulled back more of the veil. I figured it didn't make much sense to hate myself, and so many other people were handling that particular task. So I felt the difference flow through me as I lifted my legs higher and higher, moving away from everyone who believed that I was wrong from birth, and raged. Soon my feet weren't even touching the ground, and I stopped pumping them all together as I floated higher and higher into the night.